The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. I am the final speaker, so I will introduce myself. I am much taller than I appear. My name is, uh, is Kevin McDonald, and I'm about to, uh, to frighten an awful lot of people who have uh, an engineering education, because you, particularly civil engineers, you may hear some terms that you haven't heard for a long time and that may, in fact, bring up some uh, bad memories. They might not, but they probably will. And so there's people stationed around with smelling salts when you hear some of those words. You'll know when they occur, but I'll, uh, I'll let you know. So we're going to talk today about some very known civil engineering aspects of the, re of the um, <coughs> chemical reactions that occur. And uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about in particular is how we can use very relatively straightforward equipment, equipment that's already been talked about in this session, or in this, uh, in this um, pair of sessions that was in the first one, it allows you to gather information that is very useful. But if that information is manipulated with some goals of controlling a chemical reaction, such as the ones that we've been talking about this afternoon, you can start to predict some very interesting things. And so that's what we're going to do. Now, it's pretty straightforward, right? We know what we need to do for concrete. We need our construct we have constructability issues, we have structural performance, we we want a certain strength, we want a certain deflection, we need a certain durability, and many of us are tasked with taking a blend of ingredients, whatever they may be, and trying to meet all of these requirements. And some of them are straightforward and some of them are not. In this room last night we heard uh, Kazbognacki tell us that 99.9999% of the structures that the, uh, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey repairs have materials problems, not structural related problems. He wasn't sure if he had one nine too many or one nine too few, but he was committed that he had a large number of nines. And here's that word, so don't, uh, don't get too frightened. We need to talk about the difference between kinetics and thermodynamics. And so frequently these are confused by people who had the misfortune of not going to chemical engineering school. They said that uh, and when I couldn't figure out the, whether the, uh, the horizontal component of a force uh, hitting a uh, structure at angle theta was the sine or the cosine. They said perhaps something that didn't involve stresses was good for you. So that's uh, what I ended up doing. And of course we all know what thermodynamics is. Thermodynamics is a science that tells us what's going to happen. And C.P. Snow tells us that there are three laws of thermodynamics. Do you remember what they are? First and second and third line. Of course there's the zeroth law and of course, do you remember C.P. Snow, Dr. Lay told us that there were, you can't win, you can't break even, and you can't get out of the game. Those are the laws of thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is very simple. It tells you precisely what's going to happen. Because for all real processes, if you only go forward if the Gibbs free energy when you're done is more or is less than the Gibbs free energy when you start it. All spontaneous reactions have a negative Gibbs free energy. So that's where the way it works. If you don't have a Gibbs free energy that's negative, you have to put something into the pot to get it started. It's not spontaneous. And the, the zero with law is you can't transfer heat from a cold reservoir to a, to a cold from a cold reservoir to a warm reservoir spontaneously. And it's so important they made it the zero with law plus to make it all confusing. But luckily we're only going to talk a little bit about thermodynamics because we're going to talk about its much more interesting sister, kinetics. Now they force some engineers and civil departments to take thermodynamics, but they don't force you to take kinetics. It's too horrible anyways. And that's because 
we have to start telling you that we really don't know what's going on in many chemical reactions. But kinetics tells us how quickly something is going to, to uh, occur. Now, of course, the standard thermodynamic joke, all of our bodies are thermodynamically unstable. But luckily is we're not burning very quickly, and so the fact that you are thermodynamically unstable, the kinetics looks after you not uh, disappearing in a puff of smoke and flame. So we're going to talk about applying how fast things are going to happen to the largest volumetric chemical reaction that, that human beings control, and that is the conversion of stuff into glue to bind rocks and things together to make concrete. Right, the only material that mankind or humankind uses more than concrete is water, and the way we're going with uh, with uh, fixing the water and the reactions, we're winning. So eventually, we'll have all the water in the planet fixed in the Portland cement the hydration products, or uh, or limestone hydration products, or any other hydration products. Then we'll finally be water. That's our marketing point. But we know that if we take any other chemical reaction. Many, many things that we're going to use today or consume today are made by chemical reactions, such as yogurt, uh, such as coffee, such as uh, um, beer, for those of you who, uh, who may be hanging out at the hotel later on. We have someone who controls that chemical reaction. In the chemical engineering, the real trick is can you get the maximum amount of conversion from reagents to products with the minimum amount of effort, whether that's an, e an economic effort or an eco or a uh, energy effort. And in our particular case, we know many of these things intuitively. You're about to see that some of the curves you're very used to looking at are really curves telling you something about kinetics, because we know that generally increasing their temperature increases the rate of a chemical reaction. Right? That's what the hot weather concrete committee tells us. Then it says if it gets colder. Then it decreases the rate of chemical or the chemical reaction. That's what uh, we talk about on Monday mornings, rather on Tuesday mornings at cold weather. We have to keep the concrete sufficiently warm so that the reaction goes forward. Because if it doesn't, it slows down. We also know, because we use the lunar cycle to determine when our strengths get there, that time is important. And we also know that there are things that will catalyze our reactions. Things that are extremely elect electronegative will act as catalysts. The catalyst, if you remember, is an agent that does not participate in a chemical reaction, but changes its rate. And sometimes you can have a positive catalyst and a negative catalyst. A positive catalyst accelerates the reaction. A negative catalyst decelerates the reaction. And there it's very dependent on, chemi on the chemistry. One of the most electronegative ions there is is chloride. That's why we use calcium chloride as an accelerator, because it participates by complexing with the silica, by dragging it out, changing its solubility, making it much more reactive. And the best part is it, it breaks its complex. The calcium is not, the chloride is not consumed in the reaction. That's not really the best part. If it was consumed in the reaction and therefore fixed, you could use it to, to accelerate concretes that were exposed to reinforcing steel. Because it's a, a catalyst and is uh, associated with but not participating in the reaction, the uh, Chlorides are available to cause corrosion, by, by which they do this precisely the same thing by going in and dissolving the, uh, the uh, iron oxide uh, films that are formed on the concrete that's been passivated. So we know all of these things. We know solution chemistry changes because we put gluconic acid in over here. We put a dispersant in over there. We change the solubility of various things to change the reactions already. We just don't talk about it that way. Many materials are not usable as air entraining agents because their calcium salts are not soluble at high pH. As a consequence, you can have a wonderful salt or wonderful uh, detergent, but if it won't dissociate at 13, if it precipitates at 13, it doesn't really do anything. So we already know some of those things. And then we have what's referred to as a heterogeneous reaction. Here's a couple of examples. Octane and oxygen will react heterogeneously. There are two phases, oxygen in the air, octane in the liquid phase. The reaction occurs at the interface between them. So we can change that rate of reaction. The safety department says at, uh, at Beton that I shouldn't tell you these stories, but if you took a 55-gallon drum of gasoline, 
set it over where Eric is. I could throw matches at it, light them and throw them, and eventually I would hit one and it would burst into flame. And it would burn for some time. If I was to take that same 55-gallon drum of gasoline and spray it into the air, I no longer have to throw the match. I only have to light it. Because the reaction is under diffusion control. In other words, only at the interface between the 55-gallon drum full of octane or gasoline and the air, the oxygen has to come up from the air, diffuse to the surface, and react. And that reaction is very, very fast. So because we have diffusion control reactions. And concrete gets glued together by cement that very quickly goes to a diffusion control reaction, but isn't at the beginning. And that's the really interesting part, because if we can start to manipulate what happens before we get to that diffusion control, we're in good shape. One mechanism of doing that is to put finely divided, inert or otherwise, material so that you have more surface upon which the calcium silicate hydrate can deposit. When you do that, you get more strength out of less cement, which David showed you in his slides. See, I'm all, all, the best part of being last is everyone's covered all of my points already. So we know we have that diffusion control reaction, and we also know that in a multi-phase chemical reaction, which we could try to write down what happens when you go from dicalcium silicate to, uh, to calcium silicate hydrate, but the people at MIT are using supercomputers to do that, and even they are only using a few hundred atoms to calculate it, and I don't want to write it out because it's probably fairly complicated. You form activated complexes, all sorts of things go on. One of those steps is the slowest, and that's the step that's in control. And that step is, if you imagine a grain of cement that has begun to react, and those of you who have ever read or looked under a microscope for a petrographer, as a petrographer, will know you get a reaction ring around the cement grain, and then the re more reactable, reactional material is hidden. It's covered in that ring. Four reactions to occur, water has to diffuse in, or less likely, silicates diffuse out. That diffusion control takes over and the rate of reaction slows down significantly, which is why we need strengths much later in age. And which is why, by the way, if you plot strength versus the, lo the logarithm actually, to the base 10 or whatever base you feel like using, you will get a straight line. It's telling you it's in diffusion control. So what can we do? We can take the kinetics approach, and each element of the cement, whether it be dicalcium silicate or tricalcium silicate or limestone, if you, uh, if you want to uh, take those numbers, they're going to exert, if they were to be completely reacted, you can calculate their enthalpy of reaction, delta H. And if we look at uh, alpha as the degree of hydration, I always put spelling mistakes in to keep the audience interested. It's not that I'm incompetent, it just looks that way. So if alpha, we consider it to be the degree of hydration, and H sub U is the heat evolved at 100% reaction, we can start to take a look at things because if we were to get all of the materials in the cement, and the pozzolanic materials, and anything else we put in, limestone has maybe perhaps a little bit of reaction, and I'll show you that, I, that it, perhaps it does, and perhaps it doesn't, depending on which church you want to go to, that um, those materials, we could calculate if we were to get it all to react, what our ultimate heat of reaction would be. And we could calculate from there what our degree of reaction is, if we measure the heat that was evolved, divided it by the heat that would be involved at 100% reaction, we get alpha, the relative degree of, of reaction. Or what, we use, what we call in chemical engineering the conversion. How efficient was your conversion? 30%, 50%, 80% when you took these reagents, mixed them together, and wanted that other product. So we're going for, in an ideal world, the most sustainable thing to do is to have 100% hydration. We have a problem, though. We have some physical and steric issues. Steric means uh, that you have coordination. For a given water to cement ratio, there's a given amount of space. Once the space is completely filled with reaction products, the reaction will stop. So there isn't an, an alpha max. In other words, you will never get to 100% no matter what you do for reasonable water cement ratios less than about two because there's not enough space to accommodate 
all of the hydration products. Now, those of you who have uh, heard me talk before will know that I don't think 2 is a reasonable water cement ratio. I think 0.2 is a reasonable water cement ratio, but we'll get to that a little bit more. And those of you who are here and heard Tim Cost talk, he talked about measuring the heat rise of cement samples. If I put them together, mix them with some water, put them in a, uh, a little meter and measure it overnight. And this is the kind of curves that you get. Now, mine has been slightly corrected. Mine don't go down because I don't, I w I don't want to know what the semi-adiabatic heat of hydration is. I want to know what the adiabatic heat of hydration is. And so what I do is I put a sample into my calorimeter, my semi-adiabatic calorimeter, at known temperatures, and I measure what the heat loss is at a given temperature, and then I can correct for those heat losses. Is this exactly the uh, adiabatic uh, heat of hydration? Probably not. Probably making a couple of minor conversions in here. But in a phrase that I learned very carefully in, in chemical engineering school, it's good enough for engineering purposes. Because we don't know very much about these reactions. We don't know their exact mechanisms. We can only attempt to eluc elucidate what's going on the way that uh, Dr. Ramachandran did in, in David's presentation, where we look under the scanning electron microscope, and we do point counts. We try to see what's, what's where and what's changing from where. So these are, this is real data, temperature rise in, uh, in uh, degrees uh, centigrade. And you'll notice that the temperature gets over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or centigrade, which is boiling. And that's because of the correction. This is a fiction, right? Because at 100 degrees, what will happen? The water will go from one phase to another, and it probably will no longer like to react. You think a heterogeneous reaction between a liquid and a solid is bad, between a solid and a vapor is worse. Now, we're used to seeing curves that look like that. This is one that looks just like that. See the shape's the same. There's our strength. And there's our uh, strength gain, uh, and the temperature is the same shape. And so Nurse Saul in the 50s noticed, hey, this is a, notice this relationship and said, I'll bet you if we measure temperature and calibrate it, we can get strength. And that's pretty good because really this is the reaction that we have. We have some stuff, whatever it is. We mix it with water, and it gives us glue and calcium hydroxide. Then we get some other stuff. And it makes us with calcium hydroxide and water to give us more glue. The glue will we end up uh, either from reaction one or, react, or reaction two. doesn't matter. It's indistinguishable. It's hard or nearly impossible to tell the difference whether the calcium silicate hydrate started, it, whether its individual atoms started in the cement phase or started in the other kind of stuff you might put in phase. It's very hard to differentiate. And frankly, again, for engineering purposes, it doesn't matter. And strength is a measure of the amount of glue that's being developed, which is kind of true, but not really. It's not complete because the other reaction that we get is heat. And here we start to see something very interesting. We have exothermic and endothermic reactions. Endothermic reactions are colder when they're done. Exothermic reactions are warmer when they're done. It doesn't matter which kind you have. We happen to have one that gets warmer, so we can track it. But you can track the rate of heat loss for endothermic reactions as a, your analysis tool. We also know that we have to push. We need an activation energy, which is why concrete is self-stoking. Exothermic reactions that have a relatively high activation energy. In other words, the Gibbs free energy is, uh, is different, so you've done well, but you've had to get over this hill. Self-stoking reactions are very interesting because the hotter it gets, the faster it goes. The faster it goes, the hotter it gets. The faster it goes, the hotter it gets. And it goes on and on and on like that. That's why we need to convert to those curves. And when we need to understand that what we're really now looking at is the reaction itself that we are accelerating. Eventually, we will get there. But the reaction itself that we're going to look at under um, heat of hydration uh, analysis and the kinetic analysis tell us where we're going to go thermodynamics. But we're also going to measure how we're getting, how quickly we're getting there is kinetic. So that's why we had to talk about both of them. Now we've got some curves. This is a, a curve from uh, uh, Carlson uh, talking about mass concrete, uh, the Journal of American Concrete Institute, Volume 34. I think it was in 1927 or 1928. You can uh, you can see he's using a very up-to-date mixture, and this is what uh, what uh, Daryl was talking about: 0 0.9 barrels of cement per cubic yard. There's four bags in a barrel, so this is 3.6 sacks of cement barrels. That's how old this is. And he said, look, here's the temperature rise in degrees Fahrenheit, adiabatic. If I go low heat, moderate heat, rapid hardening. And then some time went by, and then uh, Carlson, who was the same Carlson, 79, a long time to be writing a paper, 
uh, I think it's 1939 now that I think about it. Uh, so uh, over 40 years, he said, yeah, well, we're a little bit better, right? We've gone away. We're no longer using barrels. We've got kilograms or pounds, depending on who you are. This is a unit of uh, weight. This is a unit of mass for those of you who are uh, 211 members. And uh, we can see we've got all kinds of different add materials and different weights. And here's our temperature rise. And you can, it's very useful. And then, uh, you know, we'll keep going. 1997, another bunch of uh, fellows building dams in uh, northern Quebec said, hey, you know, here's the amount of heat that's evolved enthalpy of reaction per time. And you can see it decays exponentially because after about four hours, it's in diffusion control. That's why he doesn't have any numbers up here because it's way crazy up there. Now, the best part is that in our modern uh, analysis, we can take those curves and convert them into heats of reaction. This is the heat of reaction for the data in the first paper in 1930s. Get about 160 uh, uh, joules per pound per day. That's what we call a bastardized unit, Joule Systems International. Pound is uh, is the common engineering system. Uh, those of you who didn't study chemical engineering won't know that you measure weight in slugs anyway. So we have all of these things up and down here, and you can see the high rapid hardening, very large curve before it shuts down. Normal heat, it's not so high. Low heat, not, again, not so high, but we, we're here. This is our rate of reaction. Notice these lines are straight. And what's the difference between a rapid hardening, a normal heat, and a low heat? Well, they both go into diffusion control about the same time. All three of them do, in fact, because the difference in these cements is just the ground of fire. The slopes of these lines are different because the slopes of the lines are the rate of reaction. You take the data from 1979. Now look at the difference between type 1 type 2 and type 3 with 30% pozzolan. The pozzolan didn't what? Affect the heat of rate of reaction. Same slope. But it goes into diffusion control faster. That's good if you're trying to control heat. It's bad if you want a lot of strength. But again, type 1 has a much steeper slope than the type 2 does. And if we take that data from, uh, from the uh, fellows in Quebec, you can see conventional concrete, again, same thing. We're starting to see some secondary reactions because we are forcing a lot more hydration out of our cement. Now, those of you who really study thermodynamics will remember that the temperature is going to be the heat, the area underneath the curve, or proportional to the area underneath the curve. The area underneath the curve is getting bigger as time goes by. So someone who tells you that the cement hasn't changed in the last 30 or 40 years, there's evidence that it has. Now, we already use heat for modeling. They keep you in the PhD club. If you put up an equation, the only part I want to look at is this. This is the heat of reaction. Anyone who does thermal modeling, mask modeling, knows that that's the input heat that you check. Everything else is an accounting system. Then some of it goes here, and some of it goes there, and, and uh, some of it is all multiplied by some pro physical properties, added to the temperature it was before, and you get the next minute temperature, and you can go on and model from there very nicely. But well, we can write a heat balance because that's all that was. And we can say that in minus out plus generation equals accumulation. It works for your bank account. It works for a concrete uh, member under adiabatic control. Because you remember under adiabatic control, in minus out is zero by definition. And if you can determine the, uh, the uh, net change for the instrument, it can be apolyled, whatever that is. And then you get a couple of neat pieces of information out of there you can get the generation has to be the extent of reaction that's occurred multiplied by the ultimate heat that would come out. And the accumulation is the mass times the heat capacity times the change in temperature. You said that's zero, and so this equals that. I can't measure, I know this, so I can calculate it from the chemistry and physical properties of the cement. I want to measure that. I can really easily measure that. So I can compute the degree of hydration, the extent to which the reaction has occurred. That's pretty interesting. Because if I really want to be super efficient, I want to get as close to one as possible. We need some required values. H sub U, and I certainly is uh, like everybody else, uh, where uh, it's a scientific organization. Uh, 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 Anton Schindler and many of his colleagues have written a number of papers that let you calculate many of these properties based on the physical chemistry. He's looking to model uh, heat of hydration and uh, mass concrete. I'm looking to model uh, what's going on in the reaction. Okay. 
So let's take a practical example. This is the kind of data that Tim uh, Koss presented this morning, right? What's the difference between these two cements? How many people, raise your hand if you think there's a big difference. No, probably not, right? I think there's a big difference. Because if I correct the data and convert it to heats of reaction, I have something interesting going on. Here's our uh, initial reaction of the illuminate phase goes on very quickly. But look, it's delayed. The lower water to cement ratio is delaying the reaction, something you don't intuitively think of. But the lower water to cement ratio also has a, a higher slope until it gets into diffusion control as opposed to the lower water to cement ratio. This is 90 ounces per hundred weight of accelerator because we're trying to make something that has uh, about 3,000 psi two hours before it was batched. So we're trying to, uh, and this is noise on the instrument, and these, you can see these reactions. You can see that the lower water to cement ratio actually gives us more hydration and faster than the higher water cement ratio. Very useful for design, and I'm not going to tell you how to design mixes because it is a complicated process, and we only only had 20 minutes. But let's take a look at what you can do next. Here's a whole bunch of mixes. I'm trying to figure out how little cement I can use for a particular problem, and so I'm comparing 0 to 80 percent fly ash, and I have 20 percent slag in there only because uh, I wanted to make a comparison for someone. And you can see the slope of the line, pretty steady at 0, 10 percent didn't change it, 20 percent didn't change it, 20 percent slag has about the same because all of this is very much controlled by the Portland cement. But when it goes into diffusion control, you'll notice the higher your plasmatic content, the longer it takes to go to diffusion control, that's the dilution effect that Ramachandran was talking about. And we have a sweet spot at 40%. 40%, we got enough in there. The high, as we get higher, you'll notice the shape of the line starts to change. Now we're mostly fly ash. So we've got a little bit of interesting lines going on here. And this is a lot of, evol of uh, digested data. And 80% fly ash, we're going along, we're getting to a certain degree of hydration, but the maximum degree of hydration, and this is time in minutes, is going to be achieved under good conditions with 40% fly ash. In fact, if you plot these out, it's at 42% fly ash. But you can do other things like this. This is a, a, a model that is looking at the cementitious fraction in percent. Uh, 12 to 22%, here's your curves. This is a blend now of cement and uh, in inert materials, and you can see the more inert material I put in the sharper, the, the more uh, reactive material I put in, the sharper the curve gets up to a point, then it starts to slow down. If I plot it another way, it's pretty clear. So here I can design the optimum fraction of surface, which I can calculate from the gradation of the sand that I used, to paste to make sure that I have the a maximum amount of reaction that I can achieve. And you'll notice the relative hydration here, as opposed to the other one, which was just absolute hydration. Relative hydration is increasing from 94 to about 97.5%. From here, I can optimize my mixture, and then I have to go on and do trial back just like everybody else did. So it's a relatively powerful technique. There's certainly not enough time to cover it in 20 minutes. But it is very useful, and it has led to uh, many mixtures that uh, use about 15% uh, uh, Portland cement and that uh, use about 500 or thereabouts pounds total cementitious material. If you put uh, a limestone in, David and I don't have the curve uh, here to present, but if you put limestone in, you will see that increase come up to a point and then it begins to decrease. Not necessarily telling you whether there's a reaction or not, but telling you that the addition of small quantities of uh, limestone will give you higher degrees of hydration and therefore higher strength at a fixed amount of time. Um, whether that occurs from a physical or a uh, or a chemical impact, it really doesn't matter for the point of view of designing mixes for engineering purposes. I'd like to thank everyone for their attention. I think we're right on uh, one o'clock. On behalf of ACI 211, I'd like to thank everyone for their attention and all the speakers for their wonderful presentations. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to get some uh, major revisions going with uh, with ACI 211 as a result of this. Uh, these presentations. So thank you.